Shalom to those watching by YouTube. If you have not yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, you can press the red and white button below and press like. And when you click like, that'll drive more folks to come to our channel and we can enjoy the teaching, which continues in the book of the Bible, James, brought to you by our Jews for Jesus Australia work leader, Bob, will continue and he will continue on for 20 to 25 minutes here. And when we've finished, we will invite everybody back into our Zoom room. If you have not yet got the address and you don't know how to log in, well, I tell you what, if you would write to us on admin at jewsforjesus.org.au, we will send you those login details and you too can follow verse by verse, chapter by chapter in the book of James. Back to you, Bob. Thanks, Jimmy. And thanks to each one of you for joining us today as we continue our study of the book, sometimes called James, but we call it Yaakov. If you're watching this on YouTube, it will help you if you pause this recording, read chapter three of the book, and then rejoin us. Thanks. Welcome back. Mark Twain, the American folktale humorist, used to say, it's better to keep your mouth closed and let people think you're a fool than to open it and remove all doubt. When you think about wisdom, maybe your mind turns immediately to non-wisdom and the regrets you have over the course of your life. More often than not, the regrets we first consider has to do with what we say, what we said to our teacher or to the captain at the club or to God at that time. Our mouth gets us in trouble so often. Of course, it's not our mouth at all, it's our words. But we use the synecdoche, mouth, to represent the language we speak and the words we say. And Yaakov has introduced us to this mouth business earlier in chapter 1 when he said this, If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit the orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. True religion displays wisdom, shown as God wanting us to have a bridled tongue, and then to live out our religion in front of others in such a way that they give praise to God. We said that it's our deeds, not our creeds, that it's going to make a difference in this world. In chapter 2, Yaakov zoomed in on this issue as well. Some will say they have faith, he quoted, and others will perform righteous deeds. Who gets the praise of the apostle? The doer, not the speaker. So now we turn to chapter 3. We could say this is the center of the book, the hump of the five chapters, and the imagery is abundant. The problem of the tongue, verses 1 to 12. Remember, Yaakov learned well the wisdom of the Tanakh along with his older half-brother Yeshua. And this idea of taming the tongue, it's not new. There's, and there's no better book for wisdom than the book of Proverbs. For instance, this in chapter 13. Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. In chapter 16, Solomon wrote, A worthless man digs up evil while his words are like scorching fire. Chapter 17, A man of perverse heart does not prosper. He whose tongue is deceitful falls into trouble. All right, now that wisdom about the mouth, the tongue, was picked up by others. For instance, the Apostle Paul would write half a decade after Yaakov, this similar note to the believers in Ephesus. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Let's just say that the Bible is full of dozens of verses that speak about our speaking and paint a serious picture of biblical wisdom. This from the Dictionary of Biblical Imagery under the topic, 
tongue, we read these points. Just as the words uttered by the tongue are symbols, so too the word tongue occurs frequently with symbolic import. These symbolic uses fall into four main categories. One, by metonymy, the tongue stands for the language used by the tongue. Hence, speaking in tongues or the languages of a nation, etc. Secondly, tongue often points to an individual utterance. Third, sometimes tongue refers to the shape of an object. And fourth, tongue can convey nonverbal messages. In Jewish thought and in everyday Jewish life in these days, the idea of Lashon Hara, Lashon Hara, the evil tongue, simply means slander. It's speaking about someone to defame them. When you start to listen or to gossip or listen to gossip from another, the way to stop it all together is to cut out the Lashon Hara. And Yaakov will help us with this. He gives us six pictures here of the tongue in chapter three. And the tongue itself is already a picture. So I guess we have seven images to help us get this right. The tongue itself and three pairs of other images. So verse one tells us we have teachers who are assigned from heaven to make us hear this and to learn the godly religion as described. He says, not many of you should be teachers. I guess some would say, ooh, 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 I want to teach like it's an exciting opportunity, but harsher judgment is coming to us because we have to live what we have spoken. We saw it in chapter 2, verse 12, so speak and so act, meaning preach and practice. And if you don't practice what you preach, it's better if you don't preach at all. So here are the three pairs of images. First, the power to direct. And he uses two images, the bit and the rudder. I don't know if you did, but I watched the Olympics a couple of weeks ago and the equestrian events were to me remarkable. By the way, these are the only events in the Olympics where men and women compete directly against one another. Watching the horses run and jump, it was literally beautiful. And they were controlled by jockeys who had the reins and they were centered. The reins were in the horse's mouth in the bit. By definition, a bit is a piece of metal or synthetic material that fits in a horse's mouth and aids in the communication between the horse and the rider. It's part of the bridle and it allows the rider to connect with the horse via the reins. I watched some seriously large animals being controlled by this bit. That's the imagery that Yaakov wants us to see. In the same way, he uses the image of the rudder, another small item on a ship or even on an airplane. The rudder moves in the direction of the lower pressure. As the rudder goes, so goes the stern and the boat turns. During turns, the boat pivots around a point near its midsection, roughly at the mast on a sloop. The stern moves one way, the bow moves the other way as the boat changes direction. Now both these items, the rudder and the bit, are designed to lead, to direct the whole operation. Now, obviously there's a person directing those direction setting elements, but the idea of the tongue as setting your direction is an echo of the Proverbs and of the words of Yeshua himself. Remember, he spoke to Nicodemus at nighttime and that man's life was changed forever. Yeshua called the 12 and they turned the world upside down. Whoever he spoke to, whether it was a blind man or a woman at the well, when he spoke, life came from the dead, even when he called Lazarus out of the tomb. Verse 5 says, So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. Not boast in the sense of pride, 
but in the same way a bit and a rudder guide, so our tongue guides us hopefully into great things. So the second pair, the next pair of images, are the blazing fire and the animals of the wild. Combine those here in Australia, <clears throat> we know bushfires very well. Although the word of God is compared to a fire, Jeremiah said that in Jeremiah 23, and fire accompanies the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Here, Yaakov is comparing the fire to the tongue in its capacity to ruin. Two years ago, summer, those Aussie bushfires in 2019 into 2020 certainly demonstrated that reality more clearly than most images for us city folks. 33 people died in the fires that summer and over 3 billion, that's billion with a B, 3 billion animals lost their lives. That's a devastating picture of ruin. And our tongues can ruin all sorts of relationships. That's where Lush and Hara comes in. That's where gossip and slander and spreading lies comes in. Maybe you follow the podcasts of the Reverend Tim Keller, the New York pastor of Redeemer Church. He wrote a devotional this week, which appeared and I shared on my Facebook on the 23rd. I was especially struck by his thinking about social media and debate that happens there. <laughs> Not always debate. He said this, he's quoting a text from the scripture, mockers set a city on fire. He says, mockers set a city on fire, agitating people, stirring up skepticism, doubt, division, and cynicism. This leads to a breakdown in society because people who listen to mockers cannot really believe or trust in any ideals, noble causes, or moral absolutes. Keller goes on to say that social media has, quote, given mockers a platform to set our society on fire with polarizing incendiary speech, end quote. What we say can seriously ruin people. And that's the worst of this era. The second partner in this ruin pair is the animals, and he names them beast and bird, sea animal and reptile. He says that each one of them is able to be tamed, but the tongue is not able to be tamed. Why? He says it's a, look at the quote, restless evil and full of deadly poison. Even a little poison will kill someone. Our relationships are what matter more to the Apostle Yaakov than anything else. Warren Wearsby said this, for every word in Mein Kampf, you know, Hitler's classic, we'll say, there were 153,000 plus words. For every word in Mein Kampf, 125 people lost their lives in World War II. That totals 19,200,000 and change. Actually, he's only talking, the total is only the military personnel who died. If you include the civilians, the number is doubled. So for every word in Hitler's magnus opus, 250 people died during those six years. You get it, the tongue is a fire and it's unable to be tamed. Third, the third pair are the fountain and the trees. These are places of delight and pleasure or not. But the apostle is saying we have a choice. We can have a fountain of good water or a fountain of bad water, a tree of good fruit or a tree of wrong fruit. I hear the echo of Yeshua, and maybe you do as well. This from Matthew 7, when Yeshua said, Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth good, I'm sorry, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that does not bring forth good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. 
whether it's a fountain at Trevi below Rome's Spanish steps or in the middle of J.C. Nichols Parkway in the Country Club Plaza or here in the middle of Sydney's Hyde Park, these fountains are draw cards for tourists and those who are thirsty. If a tourist approaches one of those majestic fountains and finds the water bitter, you can bet that the news will spread and that place will stop being a stop on the tour maps. It's an outrageous idea that a fountain can produce both sweet and bitter water. It just doesn't happen. It's against nature. In the same way, the idea of a fig tree producing olives is against nature. In, in the same way, our words ought to reflect the true religion, the wisdom of God, and the Lushan Hatov, <laughs> the good tongue of saying what we mean and living in front of the world in such a way that they will testify about God. Yesterday, I attended a funeral on live stream due to Australian regulations, government regulations. Only 10 people were allowed in the place at the funeral parlor to see the over 90 minute ceremony of the life of Dr. Lionel Hovey. When I watched, there were 250 people watching at the same time. <laughs> he was a Jewish man, 82 years old, Sydney-based, eastern suburbs, an anesthetist by profession, and the ceremony was stunning as testimony and eulogy came from friends and family alike. I was especially taken by the words of one of his mates named Peter, who recommended that we all go back to reconsider what Lionel had tried to share with them. And that, as he said, we had dismissed. Batting cleanup, my friend, the Reverend Michael Jensen, who conducted the funeral, shared again, as others had in the service, of Lionel's faith in Jesus, and highlighted that this one fact set him up for this life and the world to come. That's a great testimony. I think about what Yaakov is trying to get out of the believers in his letter or sermon. I, th I think if you want to know if you're living in true religion, yeah, take some self inventory. That's good. Ask your family. That's good. You ought to ask your neighbor. You ought to ask your kids or your parents. What does the world notice about you? What do those who live nearest you in your unit or on your block, what do they say about you? Then it's not only your words, but seriously, it's your actions that they will also notice. I say this not to make you feel guilty, but to challenge you as Yaakov is challenging you and he's challenging me. Is your religion true? Bob, is it full of God's wisdom? What is God's wisdom after all? For that, we turn again to our text, to the second half of this third chapter of Yaakov. Wisdom is compared heavenly with earthly. The contrasts are simple in Yaakov's world, and maybe he also learned that from his older brother. <laughs> the parables of Yeshua about the rich man and Lazarus, or the people who heard the word and built their house on sand or on the rock, the Good Samaritan versus the priests and Levite, the Jewish leadership of the day. It seems like it was pretty black and white in the verbiage of Yeshua, simple sometimes. Here, Yaakov wants us to get to the level of peace between the Mishpacha, and he calls us out on how we are living and what we are saying demonstrates what we consider wisdom to be. Wearsby, whom I mentioned earlier, breaks down this section into three contrasts. The contrast of origins, the contrast of operations, and the contrast of outcomes. In other words, if the wisdom we believe and to which we cling is from heaven, then it has a good chance of being worked out well in our lives. If the wisdom has an origin that is not from God, or we might say pretending to be divine, then like a tree in its fruit, we'll know from where it comes. 
Let me make this very clear. The opposite of heavenly is not satanic necessarily. Uh, yes, it includes it, but let's be frank. Yeshua said this to Peter one day when Peter rebuked Yeshua. <laughs> Imagine that moment. No, Lord. How can you say no and Lord in the same sentence? All right. Imagine that. Yeshua turned away from Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You're not setting your mind on God's purposes, but man's purposes. When a new bit of information comes to you in social media, in the reading of the newspaper, at the water cooler when you get back to work, or from the telly, ask yourself this, is the focus on man or on God? If you say, oh, my pastor is the greatest teacher or the most entertaining. If your faith is designed to get you to gain heaven rather than serving the needy or the lost, if your religion is about what you gain rather than what you disperse, then you're setting your interest on man's purposes. That's the spirit of what Yaakov is teaching. The contrasting operations couldn't be clearer, nor could the outcomes be clearer. Earthly, natural. The Greek word is psychikos, psychikos, like psychology. That's where we get the word the psuche, the, the, the soul. It's translated elsewhere as sensual and even here as natural. Back in the Garden of Eden, Satan lured Eve and got Adam to sin by saying the tree, ooh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's good for so much. And what was the final summary? You'll be like God. Hmm. The appeal was divine nature by a shortcut. And the wisdom was not wisdom at all, but a demonic ploy to get us away from God. What a waste. Now, you know a tree by its fruit, Yeshua said. And the fruit of sensual wisdom is evident. Look at the list. Jealousy, selfish ambition. He says it twice. I will always want what those guys have. And it says disorder and every evil thing. The seed of every evil thing is a heart of sensual wisdom that's like a bushfire out of control. It will ruin and dominate. But the wisdom which has its origin in the Lord himself is pure and peaceable. It's not selfish. It's not contentious. It seeks the good of the others. Look at verse 17, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits. Unwavering means it's faithful and steadfast without hypocrisy. It's not two-faced, it's one-faced. It's not bitter and sweet, it's sweet. Hmm. That's a solid citizen. That's an 82 year old saint. That's you and please God, me in service to each other and to those near us. It's straight, it's wholesome. It seeks God and it seeks God's blessing is on others. And the result, the outcome then it says is peace. Well, it's actually righteousness or being right with God as we discussed often in our series on Romans. And that happens by being at peace with God and with one another. This is a short but fantastic chapter of deep philosophy and holy theology. What will you do with all this? Next week, we'll talk more about the lust and wars and even making plans. I'll hope to see you then. In a few minutes, we'll open the floor for questions and comments about what we discussed today. Thanks for listening. And now back over to Jimmy. Two friends, I don't know if you know what true religion is but if you do want to know what true religion is and uh, you'd like to know messiah like we do and you would like to have an ongoing personal vibrant relationship with him he wants to have one with you why don't you take time now come Pray right where you are, ask him, 
He's listening, always. And when you've done so, when you've asked him to show you what true religion is and to show you how to have peace with him and you have asked him to forgive you of your sin, that which separates you from a loving God, why don't you tell us if you've done just that right where you are? And if you'd write to us at admin at jewsforjesus.org.au, tell us you've done that. We'd love to send you some literature and keep in contact with you and encourage you in this journey. It's a journey and a wonderful journey with one who really cares and loves you. And we want to be part of that. And also, if those who will be watching by YouTube, if you'd like to join us on on Zoom on Friday mornings as we continue in the book of James in the Bible, why don't you also give us your address, your email address, and we would love to send you the login details and you too can join us. And of course, it has been a wonderful time this morning and um, we will look forward to seeing you next Friday as we continue in the book of James, as Bob continues to teach us and it'll be all about humility. So this morning, Shabbat Shalom.